My name is Crypto Dog to the rescue. Welcome to my channel. I really do appreciate everybody watching, uh, liking, subscribing. Uh, just a uh, quick disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor, so uh, uh, please do make your own decisions and do your own research. Uh, but I do want to go over some news and some charting today. Uh, getting right into it, we're at 206, 286 billion. I was just looking at it like 30 minutes ago and it was at like 291 billion. So. You know, are, are we on a downtrend now? Is that a, just a quick pump up and, you know, now we're making a, having a correction at this point? We shall see in the, in the, you know, the next day or two on where it's going. Uh, kind of where I was saying with that Ichimoku cloud, we're in that Ichimoku and it doesn't like being inside clouds. So uh, especially a red negative cloud that I was kind of showing you. But, you know, let's, let's get into some other charting. I want to look into... Uh, some things trading view you know i use for my bot trading now so i use look at 15 minute charts because uh, that's what i have my bot uh set on but we'll look at some other charts and hourly charts kind of a more of a macro view but this is a micro view so as you can see that after that pump that we had of you know six hundred dollars uh seven hundred dollars it's now on kind of a small downward trend and you know that's why i kind of put this uh a new fibonacci in on this uh new baseline uh, going sideways here after this big um, pump that we had. And um, from the, uh, the highest high to the lowest low, it broke that 236 supposedly on an upward trend. So I have to, you know, refibonacci this to zero and one down here. Um, but it kind of, you know, it's probably going to tell me the same thing that it broke that 236 and is it on its way down. Now, the next thing, you know, the one thing that I do want to touch on, just kind of another little tidbit on news here, is day traders and even quick swing traders. They look at these big ups, you know, in 30 minutes and they'll go down halfway, if not a third. And that's where they'll kind of make their new their new marks on what they are looking at, as opposed to making money on a day to day basis or on a on a swing on a, on a quick swing trade basis. So if you look down a third down here on this um, pump that we had, you know, it's like seventy one fifty, basically seventy one hundred. So. I'm kind of considering that more of a new support line um, for, uh, you know, if I Fibonacci this all the way to here and all the way down here, including this pump, it's probably going to show me some things like that. So let's let's do it real quick and let's see what happens. So as you can see now where the price is, it's closer to that 618 line. And I wouldn't consider that more of a third. I consider this kind of more of a third. But again, it's halfway on the Fibonacci. So. There's a lot of things to look at, but what takes precedence? What takes precedence is basically these big pumps, all right, on a daily basis. The pumps is what day traders and future traders are looking at. And if it goes down a third, they're going to start selling it off. I mean, you know, from, uh, down, yeah, down a third from this pump, which basically is the 50% line on the Fibonacci, it's, they're just going to sell it because that is a sell point. And they'll just sit there and click their mouse, click, 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 click and just sell it off and make the money that they are all now, you know, kind of sitting here and making right now. And when it takes a big pump down, they just made a bunch of money. So just something to think about, because, um, you know, again, I use Profit Trailer, um, a bot. And, um, you know, on a sideways market, it actually works better um, than these big pumps. When I have these big pumps, sure, I, you know, I, I buy in right here, but there's nothing else going or selling out, I mean. So there's nothing else going on but selling. There's no buying going on with these quick pumps like this. It just and plus it can't sustain. And most of the time, if it takes a 90 degree angle up, it can't sustain. It's got to be more on a 45 degree angle to kind of keep sustainment up here on these levels. But we, you know, we shall see. We'll, we'll see if it takes a, a quick downturn and goes underneath that 7,700 line. Um, so things to think about. So moving forward into a coinage. Um, it's the same chart. It's a GDAX chart, BTC, but I put it on a one hour chart. And, you know, I, I was trying to put in a corridors here. And because of this big pump, there's really no way of putting in, um, you know, some some corridors. If I take it here or I can take it down into here um, and it doesn't really show you that much as far as uh, what you can do, because, then you know, it's, again, and then this one has to come down here and then kind of do that, you know what I mean, in order to stay on the same, you know, cone wedge, you know, correctness. So it's just tough to, to kind of gauge on, on how to really uh, 
put corridors in here, wedges or whatever you want to put in here just for gauging purposes. So I use Fibonacci on this as too, but of course I do this on more of a macro level. So I moved it all the way up here. It's a, it's, it's a obvious high to an obvious low, which is down here. Um, so in that, it's kind of riding and just past that 618, it broke it and now it's kind of riding just over that, that halfway point. So, and of course, now we have another corridor here if that's the corridor you wanna go off of. But I, you know, I, I don't go off of that. So let's put this one back in here and kind of show you what I'm looking at. So that's what I'm looking at more than anything with a corridor. And um, on that halfway mark, if it breaks this corridor, it's gonna break the halfway mark, I assume. And uh, hope, you know, hopefully not go all the way down, but it, it's probably gonna go down to that 382 line. Yeah, which is down here and that's at the 6800 line. So we got I'll, I'll look into futures more and see what the contracts uh, um, are when the dates are up, which I believe they're coming up pretty quick. Um, so we'll see, you know, where, where their marks are with the contracts and how many people are actually contracted in with CBOE and CME. Um, Cause that gives me a little, that actually gives me a lot more data on uh, whether it's gonna go back down if it's you know breaking this Fibonacci and breaking these little you know corridors that are on a new baseline, it'll give me more read of whether it's gonna drop back down or not. You know, was that a, just a flash in the pot, elephant step, and then back down, which is called a reverse trap? You know, as opposed to, uh, I would say this even one down here is kind of a trap. You know what I mean? Boom, and then boom. Um, you know, almost like if you walk into it, you're going to fall into a trap. So this is a reversal trap, uh, possibly, possibly. So, all right, moving forward, and let's get out away from technical charting here. Um, this is just basically saying, hey, you know, we moved up in a thousand, a thousand dollars in just two days by Helen Parts on uh, Coin Telegraph. And really, what I just wanted to show you on here is that she was mentioning Stellar and Cardano. Um, they're the biggest gains over the 24 hours. Uh, around 30 and 21 percent huge for stellar so i mean stellar's stellar is going to be a big player obviously we know that because it's uh obviously um you want the top coin coins in the coin market top 20 i believe and um uh they are has become the first blockchain protocol to acquire the sharia 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 compliance certification in the money transfer and asset tokenization field money transfer Asset tokenization, money transfer, banks, money transfer. That's why, you know, I was mentioning in my last video yesterday, Stellar and banking uh, using their uh, protocols and algorithms, it's going to go off the chain now that they're Shirai compliant certified. You know, first one ever in BERT blockchain protocol. And then Cardano is a 41%, you know, at 18, 18 cents now from 13 cents. So um, pretty, pretty big, you know, pretty dramatic there um for that so uh, good to see you know we'll see i like stellar so we'll see what happens uh moving forward Leah, again last video i was touching on the uh, government was going to be talking about and the cftc was going to be talking about crypto and uh with the i believe um house committee of Ag on agriculture so there was the two uh two things they were kind of hitting on here for What's the purpose of blockchain and uh, uh, cryptocurrency in the uh, agriculture field? And um, what are we considering cryptocurrency? Is it is it money or is it an intangible asset? So that's that's kind of what this was all kind of going. And, you know, it was just a lot of back and forth and saying, you know, uh, how are we going to deal with this? Um, and then other people were saying, you know, how, you, know do, you deal with it like everything else. We just have even more knowledge to deal with it. Uh, as far as not having any knowledge when we had the stock market out and other markets um, that we have been playing with for years on end. So, um, congressional sentiment. The hearing notably provided a window into what some members of Congress think when it comes to the subject of cryptocurrencies, though it wasn't positive in some cases. For example, uh, Representative Colin Peterson remarked that in his view, much of the cryptocurrency ecosystem Seems like a Ponzi scheme. And of course, here's the people that don't really understand blockchain and cryptocurrency. It all looks like a Ponzi scheme to them. So what's behind this? And of course, everybody else is coming in. And, and this is what I loved about this. Uh, Gensler, who offered a, a response stating, there's really nothing behind gold either. 
So what's behind it is the cultural norm. For thousands of years, we like gold because well, it's a tangible asset, you know, and we and we put a price on that tangible asset. So it's the same thing. It's just we have an intangible asset, um, but it's it's behind the cultural norm. We're making it a cultural norm. So we do it as a store of value. So Bitcoin is a modern form of digital gold. It's a social construct. He continued store of value. It's a, it's a digital store of value. So in other cases, committee members simply wanted more information on how cryptocurrency exactly works. See, they don't even understand how it works. We're creating another money supply here as I see it. I just don't know how that works. Our dollar set sets the mark for the world. I can't visualize how this would work. And, you know, and again, he doesn't understand blockchain and what uh, and you know uh, algorithms and cryptocurrencies and coins. What's their functions? Uh, but it was Michael Conway, the chairman of the committee, who perhaps had one of the most notable and telling remarks about Bitcoin. Coming at the very end of the hearing and just days after the U.S. Justice Department claimed it had traced Bitcoin transactions conducted by 12 Russian intelligence officers accused of hacks during the presidential elections, which they've caught. As long as the stupid criminals keep using Bitcoin, it'll be great, Conway equipped. I mean, you can't do that with, with, with fiat. You know, you can't catch these people because the blockchain never goes away. That transaction never went away. So it's causing you to become accountable for your actions and again, stupid criminals think they can get away with it. Not going to be able to get away with it, uh, which is why the privacy coins become are becoming a lot more into play and they're not going to go anywhere. Um, but that that was kind of good to see um, that there was, you know, some negativity, but really the positivity overall was able to crush the negativity. And here's another one, you know, Bitcoin, not a real currency, risky for unsophisticated investors, Fed chair Powell. Well, I mean, isn't the stock market? You know what I mean? Uh, same thing. Risky for unsophisticated investors. I played the stock market and I thought I was, you know, a savvy investor. I wasn't until I finally got a mentor and he kind of showed me the ins and outs of really how to look at the stock market. I was looking at it wrong. I was an unsophisticated investor. I'm not saying I'm sophisticated now. I mean, look at me. But I am doing this as a um, as a business and, um, uh you know, having that mentality from the stock market and bringing it over to the cryptocurrency market, it's only been helping me. So, um, you know, the market is bad for everyone. So I'm not saying I made huge gains or anything, but I made gains where I can. Um, some I've missed, some I've, I've not. Um, but you live and learn. And now uh, hopefully we're in a, we're in a bull market. Uh, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. So uh, I was touching on my last video again. I was looking at, you know, thinking of BlackRock and I was thinking of Black Jock, Black Sox, something like that. But yeah, earlier this week, BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, confirmed that it has established a cryptocurrency working group, while other firms, including Goldman Sachs, NASDAQ, and Intercontinental Exchange, and even Susquehanna, have been actively exploring ways to profit from the burgeoning asset class as well. Grayscale Investments, huge. Creator of the Bitcoin Investment Trust, okay, OTC, GBTC published a report on Wednesday indicating that it is adding nearly 10 million in new investments every week, primarily from institutions and other wealthy investment. All right, big money. In any case, Wednesday was not the first time that Powell's discussed Bitcoin. Last November, just as the market was knee deep in a record setting bull run, he said that cryptocurrencies as an asset class had not yet become large enough to have a destabilizing effect on the economy. He's right, we're not mainstream, so at least even, even, even back then in that bull market, um, we don't have, we're not large enough to be destabilized until we go over a trillion, because um, then we're, we're competing with stock markets, all stock markets throughout the world. Um, he also praised blockchain technology, suggesting that it could have significant applications in the wholesale payments part of the economy. So not only did he say something bad back then, you know, now he, he's not saying he didn't he wasn't ever against it, really. But, he, you know, he did make a logical, um, uh, some, you know, assumption there saying that it wasn't large enough to be uh, have a stable destabilizing effect. So um, now it's a different story. You know, well, it's coming anyways. When we hit a trillion, it's going to be a big different story. So um, let's see. The last thing I wanted to sit on this was. Yeah, so the Federal Reserve Bank on San Francisco, meanwhile, had issued a report theorizing that Bitcoin has an intrinsic value of $1,800, a figure largely based on the cost of mining one single coin. So while not, while not exactly bullish, the Bitcoin price is currently trading at 7,500, 
Now it's down obviously to 6,700. This assessment is still much more positive than Powell's claim that it has no inherent power, uh, value. So he was kind of saying, this Powell guy, he was saying that um, uh, it has no value. Um, so, you know, that kind of just trumps it right there. There's no inherent value. Well, I mean, again, we're, ba you know, what backs gold? Nothing, you know? So it's the same thing. Well, it, it's a, a intangible asset versus a tangible asset. So great things to see that these things are happening uh, on Government Hill. So uh, it was more positive than negative throughout what I got through all the news and everything throughout the last uh, uh, today anyways, after it just got over. So um, I think, uh, you know, uh, Capitol Hill there is going to be really looking into blockchain. The coins itself, I think they're just kind of leaving it up to, you know, TUSD and, you know, these other ones that are coming out and, um, and, and true USD and USDT, all these things. So uh, moving forward, uh, let's go on a little bit of world news here. Decentralized Capital launches Australia's first cryptocurrency vault. So cold storage, all right? Cold storage is going to be the future. And the reason why is because it's, it's unhackable. You know, your, your private keys are offline. You're not going to be able to um, uh, get my money, basically. And that's why I'm doing these giveaways like the Bitcoin and the Ethereum coins, uh, cold storage coins. You know, these things have five-year guaranteed life on it. They never rust. You know, they're laser etched. Um, and then you put your money on here and you keep, keep adding, keep adding, keep adding, and then just put it somewhere uh, in a vault, in the bank, somewhere, and then leave it. You know, set it, forget it, and just keep, and then keep going back to it and adding more to these Bitcoin or even the Ethereum one, you know. Uh, hopefully Ethereum can get their shit together because uh, it doesn't, it's not looking too, uh, too good for them right now until they can get their scalability things um, moving forward. So uh, cold storage, you know, I just wanted to touch on this, that Australia is opening up, you know, they're not the first ones obviously to do this, but it's good to see because, you know, Australia is big on cryptocurrency. So um, a couple other Zappo of, you know, they, they do deep cold, cold storage, you know, and like military grade bunkers and so on and so forth. Great Zappo, but they deal with big money. And of course, that's what the Australia, this Australian thing is uh, first cryptocurrency vault. They're, they want to deal with big money, big institutions that want to put their money on hold for, you know, three to five years, 10 years. Um, and then they can, you know, just store it somewhere and not have to worry about it. So cold storage coin is not going away. It's going to be the next thing. So again, please like, subscribe, um, leave your Ethereum or Bitcoin address below so uh, I can do the uh, subscriber giveaway at 100 and 150. I'll be choosing my own. So let's move forward from the cold storage. Um, thorough investigation on the Binance hack. So Binance had a hack on their bots, uh, bot trading. Um, and, you know, everyone's like, oh, no, Binance was hacked, you know, on the bots. Well, you know what? They reverse everything. So everything that they see that um, was not part of your trading, they give it back to you. There's no no harm, no foul. They got tons of money um, for these, you know, just sat, sitting on the side there for these security issues. And, you know, and as they fix them, as they go, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of people say that the, the guy owner of Binance, he's not a good guy. But, you know, that's relatively speaking, because Binance is very transparent in everything that they do, you know, for the most part, except for that true USD shit with Bittrex and Binance is kind of involved with that too. But, you know, they, you know, they, they comply with pretty much everything um, that, you know, uh, a customer, a consumer, you know, wants to deal with, you know, as far as security goes and so on and so forth. So, uh, had, so Binance had potentially been at 45 million last week. Uh, you know, we were all left kind of feeling a little uneasy. My, my bot was on test mode, so I didn't get affected. But um, uh, at least, I, you know, as far as I see, I didn't get affected by anything. But it's still kind of uneasy. So, you, know, you know, how did this happen is kind of, you know, the question that we all want to know. And, you know, when I set up my, my trading bot, um, I had to give API permissions, obviously. And, the, and this last one, withdrawal, you don't, you, you don't, um, you don't check off. So you don't have the ability to withdraw funds with that API key, um, which is a good thing, you know, because you're trading with the amount of money you have on your Binance account. So you don't want to withdraw off the API. You want to retract, withdraw out of the Binance account, um, the main, you know, with, withdrawal account. So, um, ooh, I just, I just hit my video. How does that look? All right, still looking good. So. 
By default, read and trade permissions are enabled. However, withdrawal access is not because withdrawal access carries much higher risk. Finances forces users to set up an IP whitelisting and two-factor authentication beforehand, which I did, which I did, and is you know um, fairly secure. So under this limitation, hackers have found a way have to find another way to move the funds to account. So here's how they do it. Before the attack, the culprits will accumulate a large quantity of a coin that has a low volume and a small order book. So think of VIA and SIS, which these are the two that were kind of entailed with this uh, hack. Attackers will use stolen accounts to send a torrent of buy orders via the API at a ridic ridiculously pumped price, often 10,000 X the normal price. The attackers make a huge profit by selling the coins they previously bought. Attackers try to withdraw their spoils from Binance. Once it's off the exchange and onto the blockchain, it becomes almost impossible for anyone to reverse the trades. Now, they can't reverse the trades, but again, it's on the blockchain. You're not going to get away, guy. You know, as much as you think that you are, you're not going to get away unless you just, you know, you stop using cryptocurrency now. Um, but it doesn't, you know, once you get away with it once, you're going to get greedy. So, but you know, that's a lot of money. I wouldn't, I, you know, if you're going to do something and you're going to take that much money, be done, be out of it, go get offline. You know what I mean? Um, as much as I want to catch these guys, just as much as anybody, you know, a smart hacker, you're one and done. You're done nowadays, especially with blockchain involved. So what the data tells us, rather than fumbling around in the dark, we can use Binance's API to pull historical data on SIS BTC trades to see exactly what happened. So, um, there was a shot up of 96 Bitcoin. And let me get to that, you know, here, right here. So there's a, there's a 96 Bitcoin price. 11 SIS at 96 Bitcoin price, okay? Everyone was looking at this. Nobody was really looking at this one down here. It was 13,152 SIS at 1.1 Bitcoin. So that's a whole lot more money than 7 million, 97 million, okay, was, was taken out of this big bubble right here as opposed to the you know the little one that we were looking at so that's a hundred million dollars that's someone was able to uh, get in there very fishy um but of course you know i read all this and they were saying that that's not fishy that sis was saying no they weren't hacked at all they know nothing you know nothing seems too fishy to them it just you know the last buyer of 84 capping land this is strangely neat so then this is what this guy is saying. This guy did a very thorough, thorough research about this. And uh, so did I. And, and he covers pretty much everything and then some of what I actually figured out myself. So uh, therefore, $96 million in trading volume must have come from only one of 133 accounts. Yes, you can be traced. There's a lot of money per account to keep on an exchange. That's a lot of money. Yeah. So uh, unpacking the 11 SIS buy at 96 Bitcoin, that's even stranger. So there's only one trade here. So this means somebody must have had a whopping, you know, thousand Bitcoin on their exchange account. Who's going to sit there with thousand Bitcoin? You know what I mean? Six million, seven million dollars on an exchange account? I don't think so. Unless, you know, and they said it was sitting there. And I'll look into that and see how long it was actually on the exchange before he actually moved it. Because I got a feeling it went from a cold storage to the exchange to boom out. Yeah, we'll see. At this point, the simpler explanation would be a system glitch or exploit that it allowed these erroneous trades to be placed. So basically, system glitch basically means that there is a window of opportunity for the hackers to exploit. Uh, and then he had the via coin pump. So this was in, in tandem of what was going on with the syscoin on BTC. March 7th, the price exploded. Uh, just like SIS, the number of trades and trading volume also spiked. Sorry, I didn't come around the same time, but it did the same thing almost. But there's some differences. And I'll show you here in a second. So why buy while buy is trading, excuse me, activity chart and candlesticks chart looks similar to SIS, the historical trade data looks very different. So as you can see, uh oh. So as you can see on this chart, okay, there's that SIS one, there's that SIS one. All these little red ones is the via coin via to Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, if the attackers use API keys to make bonus trades for SIS, I'd imagine we see distribution of trading on some of the via, um, to the via incident, but they're not. 
So if we unpack all the trades into an individual ones, compare the distributions between the two, it's obvious that CIS had much higher trading volume, obviously. So, uh, and again, you know, they're not saying that, um, uh, CIS isn't, they're saying that they weren't hacked at all and there was no really anything too fishy about what was going on. So the question was, did we witness an API keys phishing attack or did we see something else entirely? So Binance hasn't really responded to any accusations, which has added more fuel to the fire. But, you know, anybody that says that they lost money, contact Binance. They'll get you your money back. You know, they'll, they'll research it. And if it's correct, they'll, they'll give you your money back. So the, the last thing that I wanted to touch on this, and this was something I actually questioned, was I thought Binance's maximum withdrawal was 50 Bitcoin. How could 2,000 Bitcoin leave the hot wallet? Well, based on this, this is known as change. Okay, sometimes the coin value of the output is higher. Sometimes the coin value of the output is higher than what the user wishes to pay. In this case, the client generates a new Bitcoin address and sends the difference back. This is known as change. So 20 Bitcoin, two BTC was sent, 18 Bitcoin change, okay? What does this mean? So look at this, 200 Bitcoin, 16 BT cent, 18 BT cent, 20 cent. So they're cutting it up, okay, as much as they can and sending it all in one fell swoop. And if they can't send it all in one fell swoop, they just kick it back. The rest of whatever has not been sent, kicked it back uh, to the um, uh, return address. So that's that's really how they're doing it. You know, and if it, they're able to kick 2000 BTC in one fell swoop, they're gonna do it. So, uh, and, you know, 2000 BTC are not out of the ordinary and is certainly not evidence of theft. So, and it was authorized by Binance. So, you know, that's questionable as well, but you can do it is my point. They can only do 50 at a time. So that's kind of what the whole thing with KuCoin shares is they want to buy back and do this whole bonus program, but they can only buy back so many at a time. So, you know, people are missing out on windows of opportunity with a uh, program, you know, getting kickbacks of, of uh, uh, KuCoin shares at a, at a good price. They're getting it slower and then it's not at a good price. So 51% attack on SIS, um, you know, Is it is is it a fifty one percent attack on CIS? Um, you know, th this is kind of getting into the mining of it all, and I won't cover this topic. I, he, long story short, they claim this incident was a strange coincidence. CIS was not hacked, so that's kind of what I was saying. That, that CIS says they weren't hacked. Um, they were saying that the miners were asking, setting their fees higher than the default rate which made the transaction fees, um, you know, left unmined. So I, I really don't understand, even as a miner, I don't understand how that works. Um, you know, so they're, they're stuck is kind of what they're saying is why there was a buildup of cis coins, I guess, you know. So uh, if that answers the question, okay. But, you know, again, well, I just wanted to go over that just to say um, that, you know, there was research done. There was definitely an investigation done on that. And Binance seems to still be uh, a secured uh, exchange to my, in my eyes, because um, they back it. If something goes wrong, tell them, and then they'll go and investigate it and give you your money back. They have a huge resource of, of uh, money in you know in the toolbox over here just for these purposes. So moving forward, Mastercard wins a patent for speeding up crypto payments. Oh my God, this is going to be great for the banks as well. You know, Mastercard on a U won a U.S. patent on Tuesday for a method of speeding up cryptocurrency payments. Um, I mean, to reduce these transaction times, this is what they're trying to do. To reduce the transaction times, the company would be offering a new type of user account able to transact in cryptocurrencies through existing systems for fiat currencies. So this account would link a series of profiles able to identify users' fiat currency amount, a blockchain currency amount, and an account identifier and an address. So. The transactions themselves would use the fiat currency's payment and security features, but each transaction re would represent a cryptocurrency. So, I mean, great way to segue it into the market where you're still using fiat currency payments, um, rails and security features. So everybody is familiar with those features, but each transaction would represent a copy in cryptocurrency on the blockchain. So is being used in tandem and is it a is it a two-step process right now sure but that helps it get mainstream because then people can segue it and go you know what 
this is a two-step process. Let's just get rid of this now. That's going to be coming down the road, I think, if, if uh, this actually, you know, they, they got the patent for it and they're going to be implementing it. You know, a lot of things I do on cryptocurrency now, uh, when I first started last year, you know, seven, eight months ago, you know, I, I'm using credit cards, deny, 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 we don't take credit cards. And it wasn't because I was buying cryptocurrency. It was just buying things that had to do with cryptocurrency. Um, you know, whether it be, you know, coin tracking or something like that, you know, the, you know, sure, some of them you're able to, you know, put your credit card down. But a lot of them were like, we only take crypto and that's it. We don't want, we don't take credit cards because we're having issues. So now MasterCard and Visa, they're on, they're on board with this. So um, last, but, you know, last thing on here, indeed, this is not the first time MasterCard has expressed interest in, ad, in addressing consumer protection in the space of crypto. And they had, and this isn't the first time, but they finally got a good patent. Um, having applied for a separate patent last year, looking at building refund services for cryptocurrency transactions. So um, the refund services, um, that's uh, Stellar. Uh, that's IBM. IBM is going, you know, like I was saying in my last video, IBM is getting into the refund services um, uh, on that. And um, uh, Stellar got the Sharia you know, certificate. So they're going to be working in tandem to get the refund services. So they're probably going to get the patent for that or something of the sort um, for that. So it's just good to see that MasterCard is, is moving forward. A whole lot of positive news is out there nowadays, um, you know, this week anyways, and after, especially after that big little pump uh, with the elephant walk. But we'll see where it moves from today. Uh, let's see, moving in. So I've been looking at my Twitter a lot lately. You know, I've, I've been kind of out of it for the past two weeks because I've just been really um, focusing on my bot and getting my bot up and running. Bot's up and running and uh, it's already making money for me. So I have some pretty, pretty strict uh, styles of strategy and uh, some pretty lenient ones that I work with it. So it works pretty good. I'll put the, I'll, I'll list those up sooner or later um, here when uh, I get um, uh, at least enough feedback on everything that I'm, uh, I know that I'm on a good uh, configuration for my bot trailer. So Salih Sarakaya, you know, I, I uh, follow Salih Sarakaya. Um, this was a uh, theta token. So I, I just wanted to go over this real quick. I'm not going to play the video, but when I watch this video and they're all about video uh, stream and uh, not video streaming, um, let's look into it real quick. So the next video delivery powered by you and kind of, you know, they, uh, what they are trying to do is more in the, I would say more in the gaming uh, realm. So uh, I got a feeling that Theta Token will take off when it comes to the gaming part of it. Um, let, let, let me let, let you listen to this real quick. Maybe if it'll load. I keep forgetting that I, I use and I use Google. Technology, Technology today is today amazing. Google. But somehow streaming quality, quality and load, load times, times are still, still terrible. terrible. Everyone, Everyone has, has a, computer a computer with extra bandwidth, bandwidth to spare especially when a machine's not being used. And now you can make money by putting that bandwidth to use thanks to Theta Token. Here's how it works. When you're watching your favorite streamer or when you're asleep, Theta Client will tap into your extra bandwidth to relay video streams to local viewers. They'll enjoy improved stream quality and loading times while you earn Theta Tokens. The more you deliver, the more you earn. With your tokens, you can send donations to your favorite streamers, unlock premium content, and buy and gift virtual. Okay, so right there. So, you know, this is kind of what you're getting. You can send donations when, when you, you, you know, give them, let them use your bandwidth that you're not using on your, uh, on your computers. Um, and then you, you can, so what, what can you do with the coins? Send donations, unlock premium content, and buy and get virtual items. So virtual. <laughs> Uh, whew, excuse me. So, um, buy and gift virtual items. So virtual things. Gaming. I, I just, I, I just kind of see that with gaming, and they have uh, a lot of gaming uh, apps that they're already on their uh, blockchain um, and infrastructure. So, or not infrastructure, but uh, you know, use of the coin. So, um, I'll look more into Theta, but it, you know, when it comes to Twitter, that was a really good um, uh, uh, interview. Uh, with this guy, he's a marketing leader, I guess, uh, Wes Levitt. Um, and he does all, obviously, all the social media and so on and so forth. So, it, you know, it was good uh, to kind of listen to. And again, he was focusing more on gaming 
um, than anything when it comes to this. Because when I hear video and blockchain, my eye raises, you know what I mean? I mean, think of EOS, EOS, and they want to do video streaming um, on the blockchain. I mean, it, it's just crazy that you want to video stream. This is video delivery, so it's a different thing than that. But the bandwidth is really something that is, I really wanted to touch on as well. Using unused bandwidth, and you know, instead of using a centralized server area, um, you have to use all that bandwidth. And once they hit a certain amount of bandwidth, that's it. You know what I mean? Everybody starts slowing down. So now we can move it across computers that are closer to you. Um, so the bandwidth is faster streaming. Um, and you can get it from multiple resources. So you never have any glitches or ticks, you know, when you're watching YouTube, you know, it doesn't ever freeze up on you and you're just start, you know, doing that whole circle thinking, thinking, thinking mode. Um, you won't get those anymore, at least not a lot of them, um, especially when you're video uh, playing, um, which is great because, you know, that's the big thing with video uh, gamers. They don't like glitches. They don't like uh, pauses in their game um, because it, it causes them uh, to lose sometimes. So that's why GPUs are huge on gaming. Um, so think of the bandwidth, right? So this is a, to a token that you can just set it, you know, you know, if you're not using your computer or bandwidth on your computer, it'll take that bandwidth and use it um, for the purposes of video uh, delivery. So speaking of which, again, I, I keep touching on Fogcoin and I keep looking and looking and it has nothing to say on whether when the pre-sale is, when it's coming out, what the hard caps are, what the soft, they have nothing out right now. But it's the same thing with cloud computing. They want to use the bandwidth and all your, um, uh, computer processing that you're not using at the moment. Fogcoin wants to use that and then pay you. And Active Ether is obviously the company behind Fogcoin. But man, I just, you know, I see that these bandwidth ones, I mean, it's like almost like mining if you think about it. You're letting them use something and in return they're giving you money. So it's a service that you are actually providing for them. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, as a business, I'm definitely going to be using these. So uh, anything that I'm not using at the moment, because I have multiple computers, um, it's going to be using on the bandwidth and gaining me coin, whether it be Fog Coin or um, uh, uh, Theta Token. So it's just good to see. So last but not least, okay, Crypto Fear and Greed Index, 42 today on the gauge, 39 yesterday. Great to see that it's still going up on an upward trend. You know, now that Bitcoin is kind of going down a little bit. And let's look back down, look at, you know, Bitcoin one more time on GDAX, uh, Coinigy. And yeah, you know, it looks like it's kind of be staying and kind of going sideways there for a little while. Hopefully it uh, it breaks through the Ichimoku cloud, which I don't have up here at the moment. This is a one hour, so I can kind of stick it up there and show you what I look at on a macro sense with each Ichimoku. Uh, not one hours. Day set. Day chart. When you have a day chart. Um, for Ichimoku, I believe, uh, works a lot better with day charting. Uh, so macro trading basically. Um, and you know, as you can see, even on the day chart, it's still going up, still going up and it's going to, you know, if it breaks that 618 line, that's going to be a great thing to see on there. So, um, it, it's looking really promising for everything, but you know, right now we're having a sideways market. Good for my, my trading bot right now. Anyways, um, just cause of the way I have it set. Um, and I'll have to tweak it later on. So you guys have a great day. Again, please like, subscribe, hit the bell, comment below. I really greatly appreciate everybody watching. And you guys have a great day. Keep up the grind.